personally to ensure that you get the kind of care you want and need regardless of whether you are able to advocate for yourself or if someone else is advocating for you. Now I'd like to introduce our guest speakers, Dr. Elizabeth Collins, Beth, Medical Director of the Palliative Care Service here at Leahy Hospital and Medical Center, and Ellen DiPaola, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Honoring Choices, Massachusetts. Dr. Collins and, uh, and uh, Ms. DiPaola are leaders in their fields, perfect speakers for today's topics. You can read about their bios in your program. Um, I'll turn the program over to you now. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you, every, everyone, for joining us today. Hello, can everybody hear us? Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, Ellen and I are actually very honored to be here today to talk about this topic that is very near and dear to us. Um, Ellen and I and many other of the Leahy community have been working together on Honoring Choices with its affiliation with Leahy Health now for four years. So we want to share today with you um, what we've learned and what we think we can do going forward. These are our only disclosures. I'm going to step over here. So our goals for today are, I hope that at the end of today, every single one of you walk away understanding why it is absolutely important for every single one of us and every single one that we care about, 18 years or older, to have a health care plan and to know what they need to be able to advocate for for themselves. And also, one thing that we've learned is that life, like health, is a journey. It's got ups and downs. And through that journey, our choices and values might change. It's something that we need to keep revisiting. So it's something that needs to be a constant discussion. And the more we talk about it, the less frightening it is, and the better we are actually equipped to um, do the best that we can for our lives. Also, I hope we all understand that palliative care is not about end-of-life care, but is actually about walking with and caring for patients that have a serious illness throughout their entire life of, of their illness to help them really live the best quality of life possible. And also, I hope that we all realize not to wait to ask to, to make these decisions, that we all should be empowered to know we have a right to know what we want and to make sure we tell our caregivers and our health care system what's important to us. So we're going to start today's um, talk and end with a personal story. So these are my parents. Um, at the time of this picture, my dad was 90, my mom was 84, and we lived in a multi-generational house. They were the ultimate grandparents. They helped my husband and I raise our two kids when I went back to medical school when my um, kids were kindergarten and first grade. And my mother loved Christmas. And it was three weeks before Christmas, she was polishing silver and suddenly had severe chest pain. She suffered a massive MI. So in that one moment, our entire family's life stopped and changed. She was here at Leahy, and despite all the things that technology can help, they weren't able to fix anything. And so earlier that year, I had started the program here, and now I was suddenly the family member in need of a palliative care consult. And so at that point was when we had to really start and think about what's the best thing going forward. My mom had always been clear she wouldn't want to have aggressive life support. My dad, as you can see, though, was an elderly Chinese man who did not like to talk about end of life or even other options. And so all my father kept saying was, let's bring mom home. And so that was my first lesson. With the help of the critical care unit here, we thought out of the box. My mom was able to come off the ventilator, breathe on her own, and we brought her home for the last four days of her life with hospice care in our home on an IV medicine that actually helped her heart keep pumping. And for the first time, our family made Christmas magical for her, and the day after Christmas, those medications stopped, and she died peacefully at home with us. So it was the first of many lessons that I've learned from families and patients that even when we can't cure something, we can still make sure people are comfortable and have peace and dignity, but also we can make sure the people left behind have quality and comfort with what those decisions were. 
So um, I'm Ellen DiPello from Honoring Choices, and I come at this a little differently than Dr. Collins. I'm actually an attorney. And one of the things that was really important to me as I worked with clients um, around illness and guardianship was that I was finding that really people didn't understand their basic right to make choices for their own health care. So I closed the law practice to the slight dismay of my husband and started a, a nonprofit called Honoring Choices Massachusetts. And our job is simply to inform and empower everyone who's 18 and older to make their own health care plan, to write that down, and then to share that with their family and their physicians. So we simply say everybody's on the same health care journey. And no matter who we are and how old we are, right, we all want the best possible care right through our lifetime, whether we're promoting that everyday wellness, having those great conversations with our doctors and care providers, as we age, managing our health, and living as best and as well as we can with serious illness. And we believe everybody needs a plan, really simply. It just becomes your personal roadmap so that you can kind of track what you want over time. You create your own oral history of what's best for you. And it's easier to talk to your family and a plan you can share with your care providers right through your lifetime. So why is this suddenly important now? So in the first picture in the corner, back in the 17th century, as you know, we didn't have much medication. We had no technology. The caregiver was one person. They probably cared for an entire village but knew everybody. That person was trusted with making medical decisions. It was also in homes, and it was really a personal situation. At that time also, the life expectancy for most people was 40 years old. And fast forward to the 21st century, that other photograph is what sometimes living and potentially having a life-threatening serious illness can look like. It's hard to know, is that a young man, an older man? Was that person playing ball with their son the night before and all of a sudden everything has changed? And as much as technology has helped us, survive longer, it's also blurred the difference between being kept alive and what living is. And I think for most of us probably would agree, I know I'm one of them, that in addition to our primary care provider, most of us have at least two specialists, maybe even more. I can't tell you how many people I've met who have many more. And one of the best parts is you get more expertise, but you also get more opinions. And one of the common problems that we hear people say is who's running the show, who's, who's the person that I go to for everything. And then the good part is we're able to live longer, but now it's about living better. And all of a sudden now quality of life and how you want to live and how active you want to be and making choices about, well, I think I'd really rather go to Florida for the winter, so let's worry about that colonoscopy till the spring. That's okay. This is about living your life. So we're often asked who can make a plan, and you may be surprised to learn that in this state, everybody who's over 18 is actually presumed competent, meaning you have the ability to make your own plan. So think about how many people in your lives that encompasses. Um, and you have some really basic rights that are written right into our, our Massachusetts Constitution. Very simply, we have an incredibly strong right to information to be able to go and sit with our doctor and say, tell me about my condition, tell me about my best options. Go home, think about that, talk with your family, and actually come back and say, you know, I've got a few more questions now. You have a right to that information. Often um, patients, you know, we're, we're just in a system where it's hard to do that sometimes, but we're finding that as we empower consumers to go do that, that their care providers are very receptive to that come and ask me those questions and, and because we need that information to make choices. So if you write to that information, you write to make those choices and, and write in, uh, in, in our law, you have a right to write them down in your own plan. This isn't a maybe, this is your right to do. And we have five Massachusetts care planning documents, so over your lifetime you can use those documents. They're already there for you. We'll talk about two of them today and then of course we all want to have that right to say, here's what I want, here's what I don't want. Let's try to do the best we can for me, for a loved one, for a neighbor, for someone at our church or synagogue. It's all of us. And those are our rights to make a plan. And why should we do this? You know, these reasons just keep popping up very strongly. Certainly, first and foremost, it helps you. You know, with this, it's sometimes healthcare planning and the whole healthcare piece can be so confusing. 
But basically, it comes down to this. If you can choose an agent, a healthcare agent, that person you trust, that advocate, that's step one. And you do that in a very simple document called the healthcare proxy. I'm sure a lot of you have done that already. But step two is just as important. Let's tell that agent now what you want for care. That's the important part. You know, even if I, I've known my husband since I was 16 and I've been married umpteen many years at this point in time, but when we went to do our proxies and then tell each other what we wanted for care, we were shocked to learn that we really didn't know. We were on really different sides of the what we want. And it was wonderful to talk about that, and then we both wrote it down in a, in a personal directive. So if you can do those two things, very simply, you've just protected your right. You've also helped your family to know what's important to you. We, do, we absolutely, Dr. Collins has shared with me many stories about families at the bedside when people are getting ready to pass and how important it is to know what people want at that point in time. And certainly then it helps our doctors and care providers match care to our choices, especially as those choices change right over our lifetime. So who should have an agent? So I always use this story because this is a true story. This is, was a young man, 20 years old. He was working as a um, transport um, volunteer in a local hospital. They had a health fair, and there happened to be a table that was handing out health care proxies. He took one, filled it out, and gave it to his physician. And just two weeks after that, he was in a severe motor vehicle accident that left him on life support in a hospital with spinal injuries that was definitely going to leave him at least paraplegic for the rest of his life. So he lived with his mom. His parents were in the midst of an awful divorce. His father was estranged from them, had actually been abusive to he and his mom, was not part of his life at all. And when this happened, his father had found out, appeared on the scene, and now both parents were being asked, what should we do? His mom clearly wanted to advocate for the most aggressive care, but his dad was very adamant, no, no, my son would never want to be living like this. And had he not done a health care proxy, I'm not sure how things would have worked out. They luckily found out that he had a health care proxy. He indicated it was his mom who was able to advocate. And the other photograph is a year and a half later, him starting college, happy, and accepting what his life was going to be like. So I always use this because we often think, oh, well, we're, I'm too young or I'm, I really don't have any major illnesses. We shouldn't talk about this. We should talk about this always with everyone because it's protective. Anything can happen to anybody. And this is the one way of protecting that who speaks for us is somebody that we know would say what we would want. So we come back to how do you, how do, you do this? How do you make a plan? One of the things that we wanted to do when we started this nonprofit that was very consumer oriented was to make do it yourself tools. So you could just take these tools and make your own plan. So we have a structured approach, and you'll notice we call it healthcare planning. Because it, it you know, advanced care planning really comes down to three documents, and that's it. And it plans ahead. But our question was, how do we get, how do we ensure everybody in Massachusetts gets good care every single day, today and every day on their journey? So that's why we, we refer to it as healthcare planning. And we give people a process to think about this. One of the things when we talk to consumers, which I do often, is I say, you know, before we even pick up those documents, the, that healthcare proxy, just take a moment to think about where you are on this journey. What is it that you want for care? You know, what's your wish right now? What kind of care goals would you like to sit down with your doctor and, and put together? That's that first part of what's right for you. Everything we're going to talk about today is on the Honoring Choices website, and it's free, and it's downloadable. One of the things we have is wonderful um, uh, community leaders like Dr. Collins and doctors who've uh, contributed information and articles so to, to help people just consider that information. So we do that. We look at the information. We make some choices that are right for us. Step one. Step two is, you know, now let's go test that out. You've probably been talking to your family, maybe clergy, maybe friends and neighbors, but now is the time to think about who's involved in my plan. What's their role in helping to honor choices? This is becoming more and more important as we find people reach serious illness care in the end of life and their families are kind of shocked that they didn't know this is what somebody wanted. So we're really advocating that you involve the family very, very early in these decisions. You know, everybody wants to be part of it. So that's where we talk and we write down those choices for care. 
All those documents are for you on the Honoring Choices website. And then this is the big one. This is the one we talk to consumers a lot. Because most of us have been taught, once we do those documents, they just stay in a file. Either your medical file or your bank or your vault. And it's fine there, but they're not going to help you put that plan into action. And that's the step we want people to think about. How do I take my plan now and make it really work for me? So what we're recommending, of course, to consumers is they think about this on two levels. That, that very normal level when you go talk to your doctor and you say, here's how I'm feeling today. Let's talk about my current care. What are my options? You know, and what's coming down the pike for me? What's ahead for me? All of those really help to give you information about your current care and your plan. And then, of course, if you've got those planning documents, we give them right to your physicians, right to your doctors. Do you know if you go to your doctor with your health care proxy in your hand, under the law, that has to go in your medical record. And that's not always been done. I think they're really good here at Leahy in doing that, getting it into your record, because that's your, that's your right to make sure people know who you want to call. So that's our one, two, three process. And then we took all that information, and it gets to be a lot, and made a very simple uh, who's your agent program for you. And we hope that this program is really opening the door to healthcare planning conversations right across the state. Um, and we call it who's your agent because that's where we want people to start, with that knowledge that this is your choice. It's your health care, your choice. And one of the first choices might be to choose an agent. So we have these two toolkits, and the Getting Started Toolkit I think you all have, and if you don't, it's outside for you, um, and it's also on our website. So that toolkit, now you may have already done some of these steps, but if not, let's take a look. We're trying to say to folks, do it yourself. It's as easy as one, two, three. The first step is that you choose that person, that healthcare agent in your healthcare proxy. And then number two, like we said, you tell your agent what you want for care. Write it down in that personal directive. And then number three, of course, you take all that and go right to your care providers and say, let's talk about this. Give me your best advice, your best thought. Let me tell you what's important to me. And together, those two things, you can make some recommendations for care. So that's the one, two, three. And you'll see it in the toolkit. One of the things I want to point out is that in Massachusetts, we have this lovely law that spells out that a healthcare agent is the person and the healthcare proxy is the document. So we really like to talk about the person. We learn a lot from people when we just simply ask the question, do you have an agent? And you can actually ask this question of yourself, your family, anybody in your life. It actually has this uh, way of shocking people at first. Like, is she talking about like a real estate agent? What kind of agent? But it gives us a chance to say, do you have an advocate, a person that you would pick and you would trust to talk to your doctors if you're not able to do that? And that can be, you know, I, I simply had a... You know, a couple of years ago, I had to have a procedure, really simple, here at Leahy. It was really easy, but I was going to be in surgery for a few hours. So I felt really good knowing my husband was appointed my agent, and he was there. He was going to be in charge while I was not able to make decisions for myself. So it's really nice to have that agent at any point in time. And then, of course, we once you choose an agent, you, you, oh, in the, you write it in the health care proxy. Um, and that key question is, it's very simple. Who should your doctor speak to about your care if they can't speak to you? That's the person you want to appoint. The one thing we find that is not well known in Massachusetts is we have a little bit, we're a very independent state, so our rules can be different. If you go on the Internet, you'll see that all 50 states have different forms and different ideas. In Massachusetts, we actually have to appoint an agent. For me to transfer my power to someone else to make decisions, it just is not a next of kin statement automatically. It's, I actually have to write it down in that healthcare proxy. Now, just to be clear, we all know that when I was in surgery and I wasn't, you know, able to talk to my doctor, the doctor told us what we were doing. My husband agreed with that. Great. We all move forward, right? Now, suppose the doctor came in and said, here's what we're going to do for Ellen. And my husband said, okay, do that. But my 20-year-old son was in the room and said, uh-uh, I don't want you to do that. That's too risky. So we have a challenge now. And neither my husband or my son have any more right than the other one to make those decisions unless I appointed them in a healthcare proxy. 
And that's why it's really important to do. So then second, of course, um, we, we in that second choice, like I said, we, we think about now if we have an agent, <clears throat> excuse me, what instructions and information do you want to tell them about your care? Now suppose you don't have an agent. As we talk to people in the state, many people don't. We just live in a, in a society where your family could be miles away. <clears throat> there, you may have a lot of family and don't really think any of the, those members would be a good agent for you. There are many reasons why people don't have agents. So here's what I tell people. No agent, no problem. Just start with step two. Start with the personal directive. Write down what you want for care and share it with your doctor. Same thing. Still your right to make a choice. And then, of course, starting that discussion is step three. And to try to talk about the care goals, Dr. Collins has taught me a lot about the meaning of care goals and keep the planning around goals throughout your lifetime. And I think it's important to <clears throat> remember that don't wait until somebody asks as we're trying to help to educate all of our clinicians to realize it's important to stop at different points along our life path to say, have choices or decisions changed, it's okay for you to make sure that you're letting them know what's important to you. When I did primary care, I had a 32-year-old um, patient, a man, who was labeled as non-compliant because he would never take his medication. But it turned out he had choked on pills as a young man and had a severe phobia about this, but none of us had ever asked. Had we known that, we would have been able to prescribe appropriate medications for him I had another woman who lived in a nursing home, was in a wheelchair. She was not wanting any aggressive interventions. And she herself said to me, why do they keep scheduling MRIs? Because I wouldn't even have surgery if they found something wrong. Other times, how many times we talk to someone who's so afraid of something that we know we have no control over. And even though we have no control over it, without talking about why I'm so nervous about being diagnosed with something, Sometimes, actually, people find ways of not even going to the doctor's appointment because they're so afraid of finding out. We don't do anybody a good service if we're not giving them the ability to tell us those worries and fears. And I have to say, one of the major reasons I think people don't get certain scans that we order is because they're claustrophobic, and we hardly ever even ask that for somebody. And many, many people just never show up, and then that scan may not be rescheduled for a long time. So as, uh, as we start to have those discussions, um, we tried to make it easy for consumers to do that. So in your packet, your one, two, three packet, you'll also see this. This is five things you can talk about with a provider at any point in time. We, we line it up so that those, that blue section really reflects your right. Have, those are your five rights to get information for your care, to make those goals and say, here's what I want, to write it down in a plan so that your doctors know and can honor your choices. Um, this has been a very effective tool. It seems we have a, a lot of doctors who've actually, we, we have this in an index card, and they put it right in their waiting rooms. It really helps the, the consumer, the patient, think about what do I want to talk about when I talk to my doctor. And that first question, which is hard to see, is i just like to understand more about my illness, is really the popular question with consumers. They really respond to that first one, just having more information. That's right in your packet. So any person, any age, can now move down the journey to be a, on a serious illness journey all by itself. Dr. Collins has really talked to, to us and taught me a lot about that each person living with a serious illness really experiences that disease very differently. And we all come to it. We're just all very different with different values and religious beliefs and family responsibilities. So that comes with it, too. Um, so, um, and to know that, that palliative care can be helpful here and can be helpful at every part of that phase. And so one thing I just wanted to add that I only um, read yesterday, but actually in, in the United States right now, 18% of our population, which is 45 million people, are living with a serious illness, which is incredible. And that doesn't mean they're near the end of life, that doesn't mean that they're going to die, but that means they are living with an illness that is affecting their likely quality of life and their future. So when we think about diagnosis, and what we just want to show is that palliative care, which is an approach to patient care that focuses on symptoms, quality of life, 
helping a patient and their family have the best outcomes, aligning their treatments with goals, can start at any point along this path. And even when you're diagnosed, if someone says you've got heart failure, what does that mean? What does that mean for my future? What does that family worry about? What's that going to affect our family life? There's a lot of questions and, and needs that we have to talk about. A young child diagnosed with a life-threatening leukemia that is hopefully going to be cured, that family is going through a trauma every single moment and day of their life. We can't just expect that they're going to be told to come in and bring their child for the different treatments. We have to understand how this is affecting them and what worries them. Supportive care means somebody who might be now being treated for a cancer, receiving chemotherapy, and be able to, to know what they can expect and what's important to them. I've had one woman who was 82 getting chemotherapy, and she came to me one day and she said, you know, they schedule me for my chemotherapy on Fridays, but my husband and I do ballroom dancing. So do you think that they could move it to Wednesdays? And I said, that's what it's all about. It's about your quality of life. And it's also about, I always say, how do I help that patient forget they have cancer? That's the goal. We want to live through all these diseases. Transitional means this is a time when maybe this disease is now progressing and we may not have a lot of treatment options. This doctor who is now facing starting dialysis, it's important. How is that going to affect his practice, his life, and also what's going to happen when the dialysis stops working? And then clearly when we all hopefully live a long, wonderful life and might be near the time for the last six months of our life, hospice care is a way of really helping them live quality, comfort, dignity, and supporting our families. So palliative care, I always say, focuses on the person inside the patient. And it's, as we showed in the other slide, it's really appropriate at any time along this illness trajectory, even if cure is, is still a, a hope. But also I wanted to help you realize it's a very new field. It really has only been around since the 1960s. And in the 1990s was actually the first fellowship programs that were starting. In 2008, was, it became a board-certified medical specialty. And by 2015, um, over 90% of the U.S. teaching hospitals with um, sizes of ours have palliative care programs. And thanks to Leahy and Leahy support, we were one of the earlier palliative care programs in Massachusetts, and we're now in our 12th year, and we've seen over 10,000 patients and families both in the hospital and out of the hospital, and we continue to grow. Some of the things that palliative care has enabled is clearly improved symptom management, but also quality of life. It's not just about length of life, and that's the one thing most people with serious illness will tell you. They're not that worried about how long they live. They're worried about how well they live and if they're going to suffer. But also people are always worried about their families. They want to make sure everybody else is okay. And it helps us then recommend treatments. A lot of times I'll see people in the hospital and all those different specialists are recommending different types of treatments. But we stop, never stop to say, what does that person want? What's important to that person? Sometimes a person might just say, I just want to get to my granddaughter's wedding in three months. I don't really care about that much else. That in itself can help the treatment team better align what we're going to do to help that person get to that point. It also sometimes helps us get people hospice care earlier, and we don't, aren't as so afraid of hospice. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but my father essentially had hospice care for many years and hospice care is really more of a focus of helping you live well when being in and out of a hospital is no longer going to benefit you. One of the things that I think is the um, unexpected result of palliative care approach is that it does actually help decrease costs of health care. It is definitely not what one of the goals have ever been, but when you align patients' treatments with what's important, like that woman who said, why are they sending me for an MRI? We don't have to do a lot of those interventions if they're not going to help that person with what they want. And by doing that right care and personally focused care, we actually are able to, to lower costs. Um, this was a patient. These are not the actual patients or pictures of her, but um, that I was consulted on a number of years ago, actually two rooms apart in our hospital. The older woman was 92. She had severe dementia, lived in a nursing home. 
and had just suffered a large heart attack and her kidneys had failed and she was being recommended to start dialysis and her daughter said, do whatever you have to do to keep my mother alive. The other woman was 67. She was essentially healthy, but she had a lifelong kidney disease and now was finally approaching a point where they said you'd need to start dialysis to continue to live. And she, on the other hand, said very clearly, no way, I will not start dialysis. And I was consulted to help discuss end-of-life care with her. And so clearly in sitting down and talking with the families, and the older woman, it was clearly with her agent, her daughter, her daughter had no idea that dialysis was going to mean three days a week taking her mother out of the nursing home, having her already agitated, sitting in some foreign place, having dialysis. And when she realized all this, she said, by all means, no. And the woman was able to go home to the nursing facility with hospice, died peacefully two months later. The other woman, which I never would have expected, when I asked her why she had made the decision to not go ahead with dialysis, she said when she was a teenager she had a, um, a dental surgery and had an awful experience with anesthesia. It was so awful that she swore she would never, for the rest of her life, ever undergo anesthesia. And she was choosing death over the risk of going under anesthesia to have the catheter placed that would allow her to have dialysis. And so when I asked her if we were able to have that catheter placed more safely, would she consider going on dialysis? And she said, absolutely. And so I had one of our, our, one of our female, compassionate, wonderful um, anesthesiologists here come up, talk with her. She told her she would be there with her. She came to the room, brought her down. She stayed with her the whole time and actually was there when she woke up. The patient had the catheter placed safely and to this day she's alive on dialysis and gardening. So I always feel like this is one of those times where it's important that we have to always explore why when something just doesn't seem right. And also I think it's important when do we have these discussions. The one thing I think that we've learned is having these discussions does not make the worst scenario happen. It actually helps us talk about it, prepare, helps us tell our families what's important to us. And as Ellen said earlier, it helps decrease the burden to the people we love. If we, our families know what's important to us, rather than them being asked, what should we do for mom or dad, instead they're able to say, I'm going to be my mother's voice and, and I'm going to make sure her wishes are always followed. Yeah, and, and just to let you know, um, we, we agree that this discussion is really just continuous. You know, often we think about having one discussion. We hear that a lot, you know, and go have your end of life care discussion. Well, it's not one. It's certainly many, many discussions in a series of discussions. So Honoring Choices has those same discussion guides right on the website for you. With Dr. Collins and a lot of great people here in the Northeast, we really developed a new palliative care guide, uh, which is also on the website. And so we're just going to briefly, quickly go through this as an example of, of true situations that we all, I'm sure every single one of us would say, yes, that seems like something that I've, I've known about. So in this one situation here, this young mother has just been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Not life-threatening, but it's going to be with her forever. It's, it's a lifelong serious illness that will be a chronic disease. But for her, what does that mean? What does that mean for her, for her child, her unborn child? She's probably worried, does this mean my children are going to be at risk for this? And so at this point, what are the types of questions she would want to, you know, have addressed? Yeah, and so it's that everyday planning and that advanced care planning. So one of the things I can talk to as we go down this journey is those five documents. So for this woman, very simply, healthcare proxy, right? And it's not something sometimes young women think about, but really important then to pick that person to be your agent. And so, and this woman here, 26 years old, just finished her treatments for Hodgkin's lymphoma successfully. Her hair is growing back. She's finally starting to feel like herself again. But she's been told, okay, I think we are, we're in remission or we're cured. What does that mean? But also, what does this mean for the rest of her life? She's 26. How are all those treatments potentially going to affect her health for the rest of her life? But also, a 26-year-old who's just faced potential death and has come out on the other side is a totally different woman than she was before she was diagnosed. 
and maybe some of her choices and values would be different at this point. Right, and it's a great time for this person uh, to do a personal directive. You know, what did she just learn about herself and about the response to care for her? Who are those people she'd like around her? So she'd write it down in a personal directive. And so this is a gentleman who's been diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer and he's just found out that the chemotherapy, the second treatments are no longer working. But his question is, am I dying? And, and, and clearly one of the issues is, you know, why is he worried about that? And he's not actually worried about it because he's afraid of dying. It turns out he's worried about it because he's the only breadwinner in the family. The insurance is his. His wife has medical Ill issues. So he's actually worried, how's my wife going to survive when something happens to me? Who's going to take care of her and what type of insurance will she have? Yeah, and we frequently hear that when we talk to people who are in chronic and serious illness. They feel like they're getting great care, but what they're worried about is something other than their care. They're worried about their money, their businesses. How, how am I going to pay for this care? How much is it going to take out of our family bank accounts? Um, how do I protect that? So when we talk about healthcare planning documents, we have the healthcare proxy, the personal directive, and the third one we like people to think about is a durable power of attorney. So that's a legal document, and that's where you choose someone to be your financial decision maker. And it's a great document because you don't have to actually be fully incapacitated. You could just be sick, you know, and, and be a little disabled, and your, your, uh, the person you choose could start to safeguard your money, pay your mortgage, you know, do the things you would normally do and, and harness all that money and maybe sign contracts for you to get long-term care. So that document is usually done with an attorney, although you can do it yourself, and it's a very important part of this package. We find, especially with seniors, once we, they can get that money figured out, they feel a whole lot better. It just adds to their well-being. And, and this gentleman here, so he's 46, he's got two teenagers, divorced, single, lives alone, had a history of alcohol use and was awaiting a liver transplant. And now new complications have just um, identified that he's no longer going to be a candidate for a liver transplant. So in one moment, his hope for cure and a longer life has completely changed. What goes through his mind, what his needs are, what his worries are, how does he even imagine having end-of-life care being alone? How does he help his young children deal with this? Right. And this is the time, uh, typically, uh, people at this stage can really look at the, the um, choose life-sustaining treatments. What are the treatments at the end of life? Do I want them attempted? Do I not want them attempted? This is your choice. So we have a, a, a form in Massachusetts called a, a Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, otherwise known as MULST. I don't know how many people have heard of MULST. But you, oh, one. <laughs> so we don't do MULST until we're in this serious illness stage of life. And you, very simply, it's a wonderful tool. You sit down with Dr. Collins, Dr. Collins would talk to you about where you are right now in your current care, not future, but where you are right now. And if your heart, for instance, stopped tomorrow, your heart or your breathing, here are the benefits for, for doing CPR. Here are the risks for doing CPR. What are those likely outcomes? How am I going to come back if you attempt CPR? So after I hear that information, I get to make that decision. And we write that decision down in this most form. And it's a medical order, so that's what's lovely about it. It actually has some teeth, um, that it's signed by the doctor, it's signed by the, the person, and then everybody else who takes care of you follows this medical order and follows what you want for care. So there are several life-sustaining treatment decisions on there. The first one, though, is the CPR one. And then hopefully as all of us live that long, long, wonderful life and we're at the end of that journey, when we're maybe within the last six months of our life, what's important to us? And that's when hospice care would come into play. And hospice care is not, as many people think, oh, they're just going to put me in a corner, give me a morphine drip and, and end my life. Hospice care these days is very different. It's really focusing on patient-centered and family-centered care, treating symptoms, but also let's not keep going back and forth in and out of the hospital. Let's have our care at home or wherever we are, but maximally treat symptoms and quality of life. 
so that when the natural end of life comes, that the people are able to literally still die naturally and peacefully on their own terms. And just at hospice care, at this stage of life, as you hear, it's, you know, it's a very active talking time. It's a very active time to actually review your documents, review your choices, talk to your family, and make a lot of changes. As long as you are confident, you get to decide what you want. And that's the important story here. We really want to make sure everybody's rights are honored right through their life. And this is just on the website for you as well. On the Honor and Choices website is everything, as I said. And you don't have to, to read or memorize. There won't be a test. But this is, the, this is what we're trying to help people with, is this idea that it really is a journey. And you can do pieces of this all throughout the journey. And if you're 96 and haven't done anything, so what? You just use the tools that are here. You just start from the beginning. So the toolkit you have in front of you is the Getting Started Toolkit. You can start at 18 years old and any time during that life. And as you progress, we have a Next Steps Toolkit, which gives you a lot of the information we talked about today. So as I said, I would end with the personal story. So after my mom had passed away, you know, my folks were married for 56 years. We didn't think my father would last very long. He was also very against any type of hospitalizations or medical care. So the goal was let's just keep him home where he wanted to be and comfortable. And to our surprise, he lived another four years. And he lived those four years on his own terms comfortably with dignity because he actually, we made the decision to not be going in and out of an emergency room or in and out of a hospital. He was 90 years old at that time and we had what's called a bridge to hospice visiting nurse program. They would be in and out of his care based on his needs and he never saw a doctor other than me, which was not for any medical care. He never had a blood test, never had an x-ray, he never went to an emergency room, never went to a hospital and he lived fabulous quality of life at our home for four years. It wasn't until the last five months of his life when his dementia got worse and he started to aspirate that his quality of life started to decline. But because we were able to get now hospice nurses involved, he actually passed away in the bed he slept with my mom in for years in his sleep. And he died so peacefully that I have, as I, I'm been a hospice medical director too, I wasn't sure he died when he actually died. And I got to say, so that was my other big lesson at the end of all this is that even when we can't do certain things, or even if a person doesn't want certain things, there are always options. There are always options of making life the best it can be. And as Cindy Gruber, I think, always says, this is all about living until you die. We all know that will happen for all of us, but now we have the ability to really choose how do we want to live and how do we want to make sure our wishes of how we want to live are known to everybody. So with that, we thank you very much. And there's our emails if anybody wants to.